Okay, I think we can start now. So, welcome to everybody uh, to this uh, proteins and proteome session that I'm very happy to co chair with uh, Julien Rack. So, Julien did a PhD in computational biology at the EPFL in the group of Vasily Hatsiman and Katis, and then a postdoc in the group from David Kveller at the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research in Lausanne. And now he's a senior scientist in David's group. Uh, working in computational cancer immunology. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lady Lane and I joined the CIB uh, long ago in 2004. And I worked as a Swiss pod curator for a few years before creating the Calipo group with Amos Perrock in 2009. And we developed NextProt, a, a knowledge base on human proteins. So in this session, we will have two 15 minute talks and five five minute talks. And this is very, very short to encompass all the aspects of the protein world. So let's start right now. Uh, don't forget to attend the poster session afterwards because there is also very interesting protein related science to discuss there. Um, as in all the other sessions, you are very welcome to post your questions in the Q&A chat box. Uh, if time's allow, we will ask one or two questions after the 15 minute talks. But all the other questions will be addressed uh, in the follow-up uh, mid the speaker session. Uh, to facilitate our work as chairs, please precise your name and indicate the name of the presenter to which the question is addressed when you post your question. So now we will start and I leave the floor to Julien. Thank you very much, Judith. So I'm very happy to introduce Marcus Muller, which is a, who is a senior scientist in the group of Mark Iberson from Vitality and also working with Michal Bassani at the SHUV. He will present a research leadership they recently published to robustly identify non canonical HLA bound peptides. So the floor is yours, Marcus. Thank you. All right, so thank you, Julian. So the work I'd like to present here uh, stems from a collaboration between the SIP and Michal Bassani's group at the uh, SHUV. And I'd like to thank uh, especially Chloe Chong, who did this great work as part of her uh, PhD. And also Michal Bassani's group and our collaborators uh, from Lin Seng's group at Penn and Uwe Ole's group at MDC and Didier Jonas Group at EPFL and the Ludwig uh, Ford Fund. The somatic genetic alterations that define cancer provide the immune system with the means to generate uh, T cell responses that uh, are able to recognize and eradicate uh, cancer cells. Now, unfortunately, this is not, uh, this doesn't work for all the patients and for those patients we try to help them with uh, cancer immunotherapy. In Michal Basani's group, this works in the following way. Um, we obtain biopsies from the cancer tissues from the patients. Then we use uh, these tissues to uh, do exome sequencing and calling the somatic uh, variants. Then we do uh, RNA-seq on uh, these tissues uh, in order to extract the long known coding RNAs and the retroviral elements here designed as TEs that are expressed in these tissues. Uh, we translate all these uh, genomic sequences into protein sequences and store them in a FASTA sequence database. If there is enough tissue available, we will also perform immunopeptidomics. That means we will isolate the HLA binding peptides uh, we will fragment them in a mass spec and we will uh, match these uh, MSMS fragments against the uh, proteogenomic database we obtained by exome sequencing and RNA sequencing. The most promising HLA peptides uh, will then uh, be screened uh, for T cell uh, reactivity. And if we find T cells that react, we will isolate them, expand them, and re-inject them into uh, the patient. 
Now, um, if you do this type of proteogenomic MSMS searches, you deal with these databases. And there's an important characteristic of such a database, which we call here the pi zero over pi one ratio, uh, that uh, will be important as you will see. So pi zero over pi one is uh, nothing else than the number of wrong PSMs, peptide spectrum matches, uh, that the database uh, is able to produce divided by the number of true PSMs. So if you take the, the protein coding database, this is uh, maybe 30 megabytes in size, and in a good experiment, you can produce maybe uh, 10,000 peptide spectrum matches. Uh, on the other side, the long long coding RNA database is a little bit larger, but even for a good experiment, you will only be able to produce uh, something of the order of 100 peptide spectrum matches. Meaning that uh, for the, the, the exome sequencing database has a low uh, P0, P1 uh, value, whereas the, the long non coding RNA database has a high uh, such value, which means it is much more prone to produce uh, false identifications or false positives. Um, this is important. Uh, in this little toy example here, I did just in R, you can see this, that uh, if you, and this is what we do in proteogenomics, usually we combine all the databases into one file. If you combine the protein coding database with a low uh, ratio and the long non coding RNA database with a high ratio within the same database, search them, for example, with mascot, uh, maxquant, or comet at the FDR of 1%, which means that 1% of your uh, PSMs in the result list will be wrong. Uh, then you find something maybe a little bit astonishing. If you recalculate the error just for the protein coding uh, group, you will find that this error is actually lower than 1%. It's in this example just 0.5%. Whereas the error in the long non coding RNA part uh, of the PSMs will be much higher. In this case, it's 20%, uh, but it can be even higher than that. It can go up to 100% wrong identifications. This is just because uh, these different pi 0 or pi 1 values of these uh, different groups. Uh, this is not only important for this toy example, it's actually important. And uh, in this uh, example here, there was a science paper uh, published that claimed that 30% of the uh, HLA-1 binding peptides stem from proteomal splicing events. Proteomal splicing is something uh, where the, the, uh, the Protein fragments reform peptide bonds in the proteasome, but not in the order they had in the original protein sequence. This has, it has been shown that this exists in very rare cases. So it was kind of astonishing as this paper came out uh, and claimed that 30% of the HLA peptides stem from these events. Uh, us, and not only us, we were a bit skeptical about this, and we published a paper in MCP where we reanalyzed their data. And uh, I think we could uh, show that uh, at least uh, that uh, these proteosomal splice peptides are mainly a statistical artifact due to uh, this very high P0 over P1 ratio they used in this publication. Even though they never published a database, uh, we can reasonably well assume that. Now, what can we do in such a situation? Uh, the, the solution is actually very simple. Uh, instead of using one global threshold for the database, we can use uh, thresholds that are adapted to do this uh, varying uh, pi zero over pi one ratio. Meaning for the protein coding um, part of the database, we saw that the error is a bit lower than 1%, so we can uh, be a bit more tolerant there, we can decrease the threshold, whereas for the long non coding part, the error was significantly higher than 1%, so we have to be a bit more uh, restrictive there and increase the threshold. The question is now, uh, which thresholds uh, should we choose? There are several ways to do that. 
uh, one way we chose in this neon software was um, is based on this uh, theory for stratified FDR calculation or group specific FDR calculation. And it is based on the posterior error probability. I don't want to go too much into the details here. Um, but you can show that uh, if you set the posterior error probabilities at the same level for all uh, PSM groups in your database, um, then the thresholds that correspond uh, to this level will give you a maximal number of PSMs under the condition that the total error uh, is smaller than a value of alpha. So this is an exact theorem, and this came very handy here for our problem because it uh, allows us to define these thresholds. Um, so we implemented that. So we did, we ran a max quant search without that. So it's just with a global FDR of 1%. And for Comet, we implemented this uh, system of a stratified FDR calculation. There's a lot of things you have to actually do for that. It doesn't look uh, as simple as it seems maybe. But you can do that, and then we compared uh, the two searches. So in the lower panel uh, here, you see the, the results for the non-canonical um, PEPA spectrum matches, so the long encoding RNAs and the retroviral elements. And you see that the max quant search, uh, you get a lot of identifications, but at a very large error of almost 50%. Whereas for the comet search with this uh, stratified FDR calculation, uh, the number of identification quite drastically decreases, but also the error quite drastically decreases. The same is true uh, for, the, for the retroviral elements and also for the long non-coding elements. Uh, even if you do that for comet, the, the error is still there. There's still a significant error uh, there. And we thought we can further reduce this error and we did simply just took the, uh, the uh, consensus spectrum between the max quant search and the comet search. So all the spectra that were found in both searches uh, were kept. And this even further reduced uh, the numbers, but also further reduced the error. And this is important here because in this uh, approach, we would like to have a very high uh, specificity and not so much a high sensitivity. And uh, here are some uh, results. So that's um, we found 100 or so retroviral elements. Uh, there's always about this number of uh, things you can find. We won't, wouldn't expect thousands of them. Um, the main uh, contribution came from this LTR elements, these uh, long um, terminal repeat elements. And the second most contribution came from uh, these line elements. Uh, some uh, retroviral elements are also in uniprot. They're known to be protein coding, and they also contribute very uh, significantly. For the long non-coding RNAs, most of the matches came from up, upstream from known open reading frames, and about 20% of those were not. Um, these non-canonical uh, peptides sometimes have very interesting properties. For example, in this table on the left, we took uh, we checked the expression of these genes in GTEx and for this first element here, which is a, a line retroviral element, um, it is only uh, it is found in all our melanoma patients and only in the melanoma patients. And this would be an extremely valuable target for uh, cancer immunotherapy because it's not personalized. We could apply it to all melanoma patients. But unfortunately, it was not immunogenic. It didn't produce. Uh, T-cell reaction. Um, then we also uh, we screened a lot of peptides for T-cell reactions, about 800 peptides, and we could only found one non-canonical non peptide, a long non-coding RNA peptide that created uh, a reproducible immune reaction 
However, this was a very interesting peptide because uh, it is downstream of a, a known open reading frame that is a melanoma stem cell marker. Uh, and it could also be uh, found in other melanoma patients and the, it is not expressed as a protein in any of the tissues we were looking at. So this is a very promising target which we are following, following up on and this is the end of my presentation and I would like to thank for your attention. Sorry, I forgot my, I lost my mic. So thank you, Marcus, for the presentation. Don't forget to put the question in the Q&R if you have. So we have one question from Katja Berenfeller. Uh, does the long the, the long non-coding RNA database also contain or ORF starting with non-conventional start codons? Um, as far as I know, yes, I, I had to check that, but I think yes. Okay, and so I also have one question if no one else is writing for the moment. So, um, would it be possible also to, to restrict the database by first predicting with the HLA prediction method? Because for the class one now, they are quite accurate. So, if you reduce the, the database size, then you probably have a lot uh, less false uh, positive. So would it be possible to do this a priori and then check for the MS spectra? I mean, certainly possible and a lot of groups uh, are doing that. Uh, I'm not a big fan of this because you never know how, um, how good the prediction actually are. We have examples where the prediction score is not particularly good, but we are pretty sure that these are actual binders. Uh, sometimes you have missing alleles. In this situation, you can't use such an approach either. So I think if you use such a stratified FDR calculation, you can deal with fairly large databases. That's not a big problem. Um, and I'm rather uh, do this first and then filter later. Um, then filter first and maybe lose some valuable identification. Okay, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lionel Breza, uh, who heads the core data curation team at SwissProt. And uh, Lionel will show us how Uniprot recently improved the representation of the human metabolome using RIA. Lionel, it's your turn. Uh, thanks, ladies. Thanks, Julien. I, I hope you can hear me and see my yeah. slides. So um, I, um, I am presenting an ongoing curation effort at the Swissport Group that aims to improve uh, the representation of the human metabolome in Uniport KV. Um, so as you probably know, uh, Uniprot KV is a knowledge base of protein sequences and functional annotation. The SwissProt section uh, integrates knowledge on proteins extracted through manual curation from over 230,000 references, and the resource is freely accessible through our website. In addition to sequences and function, uh, these protein records contain a wealth of information on uh, including variants and diseases, protein interactions, protein localization, um, important sequence feature like domains and active sites, uh, sequence homology, and much more. The function of enzyme is really specific since it includes a description of the biochemical reactions catalyzed by the proteins. So far, these reactions uh, were described uh, using three texts and an enzyme classification uh, proposed by the IUBMB uh, based on EC number, which were not well suited uh, for data integration. With the introduction of RIA, a knowledge base of biochemical reactions to represent these activities in Uniport KB, uh, each reaction gets a unique identifier and uh, standard computationally tractable descriptors for the clinical transformation, but also for 
so, so, um, so metabolites uh, that are involved in the reaction by using the KB ontology, the chemical entity of biological interest ontology. With this new possibility, we have undertaken a complete review of human enzymes that represent 20% of the human proteome. We have currently curated 2,897 um, human proteins using RIA. It represents more than 6,000 enzyme uh, reaction pairs and already more than 3,000 uh, unique compounds linked, linked to human proteins. This representation of biochemical reactions improves navigation through proteins and metabolites. And you can now uh, easily visualize directly in Uniport KB uh, compound structure. We have also developed uh, new tools to improve advanced search within the database. You can search small molecules and other metabolites using names like arachidonate in this example. You can also use uh, the KB identifier for the arachidonate but also chemical structures using uh, structure descriptors, descriptors like the Inshiki. Uh, this is an example of a search with a structure descriptor for our arachidonate within Uniport KB. And you see that it returns a bunch of entries, 200 support entries from different organisms. Using different types of data integrated in Uniport KB that I described before, as I mentioned before, you can then refine your search to human proteins that are associated uh, with a, a disease and for which we have curated variants. And you can, moreover, for instance, look for a given subcellular localization, looking at the proteins that are in the Golgi apparatus. And you end up with uh, two proteins that fit all the criteria I mentioned before. A better integration of data also allows to, to uh, search through resources to use knowledge capture not only in Uniport KB, but also in other resources uh, like BG, which is dedicated, a dedicated resource for gene expression. And you can answer this type of questions to know in which tissues are expressed the genes uh, that are metabolizing uh, cholesterol. Um, sorry, you, you will find more details about this on my poster, number 236, and there were also more presentation on this aspect during these seed days. So in conclusion, I've showed you that how we are improving uh, the representation of the human metabolome in Uniport KB. I hope I could convince you that it enhances integration and the exploration of the curated knowledge. Our aim is to deliver by 2021 the first draft of the complete metabolome for, uh, in, for human uh, proteins. With this, I would like to thank our funders, CERI for the Swiss federal government, the NIH, also, thank you for your remote attention and also acknowledge all the people's, uh, people involved in the production of, the, of Uniprot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lionel, for this very clear talk. Uh, our next speaker is also from the Swiss Prod group. It's uh, Philippe Lemercier, who heads the Viral Zone team. So from the very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemics, I know that uh, Philip's team has worked very hard to annotate the proteome of the SARS-CoV-2 and to apply different bioinformatics tools to try to better understand the viral transmission and pathology. And so now he will tell us about his main results. Okay, thank you, Lydie. So um, I'm Philip, and I'm going to tell you about uh, the SARS and the resource we develop in viral zone. Also, uh, how it has been uh, annotated in Uniprot and the uh, challenge we have to face. And I'll show you some kind of prediction we made already in February on the virus. <coughs> so in VAR zone, um, we made uh, a special uh, resource for especially the SARS coronavirus. So we have a fact sheet which descri describes the, the global uh, biology of coronaviruses. We made the genome and expression a part, a proteome, an interactome, which is a curated interactome. It means things that can be done manually with a function associated to it. Also, we have drawn a coronavirus cycle. Uh, you can plug where are antiviral drugs acting on it and some kind of treatment. So you have potentially the big picture of the biology of the virus and you have uh, all the time links to database and bioinformatic tools. <coughs> So the SARS coronavirus is a variant <coughs> which is enveloped 
uh, its name coronavirus, the name of the family comes from the, the spike protein, which uh, make like a corona in electronic microscopy. And it has the, the longest uh, RNA genome known uh, in life uh, because it's 30 kilobases. Uh, most uh, most uh, viruses like influenza are about uh, 12 to 15 kilobases. This one is very big. <coughs> the genome of coronavirus is um, pretty much um, organized in two parts. So uh, we had the, the first sequence, the 12th of January, which came out uh, in a few days in NCBI. And we started in Uniprot to annotate right away when we had it. Uh, most of annotation was done by similarity with the SARS of 2003, because of course this one was a new SARS. And you will see that all the genes have similarity with the old SARS, except of uh, eight here, which is completely a new gene for which we have no function actually. So the first part of the virus encodes for uh, everything needed for replication. And the virus actually creates a little uh, a vesicle inside the cell to protect itself against uh, the detection of uh, double strand RNA and, and uh, antiviral effects. <coughs> so, this polyprotein is expressed and cleaved by viral protease, and it expresses a lot of uh, like 16 proteins, which will start the replication cycle. The, these two polyproteins are annotated in just two uh, entries in Uniprot. Um, which are there, and they were done manually, entirely manually. Um, this is a topology I drawn for these polyproteins. You see that some of them are, are linked to the reticulum endoplasmic membrane, and this will actually trigger the vesicle formation at this place to protect the virus replication. Or in, in pink, this will take care of uh, the cell antiviral system, <coughs> and in gray, you have uh, the ones which will make the replication and transcription. So you see it's a huge business of cleavage and it's pretty difficult to find the right site and the right topology. But because it was quite similar to SARS, we were able to do that quickly. The second part of the genome um, is about the gene, the gene needed to make the virion, so the structural genes, and a lot of genes we are modulate uh, host response as well as um, immune response uh, of the host. So um, we have to change the, the, the gene model, NCBI a bit rushed, the gene model, they missed uh, or 9B or 13 and they added another one which was not relevant. So we modified it and we, we of course uh, provided that for everybody so, so they have a better gene model. So this is the, the kind of annotation we have. We also had to modify the naming because there were a lot of trouble because in the polyprotein, some protein was called non-structural, but there was called as well in the subgenomic here. So you have two, for example, NS6, which create confusion. So we would seen with experts in coronavirus and, and name them off there. So there is no confusion possible. So we have a function for pretty much all of this. You see, uh, this, this is the control vocabulary, which made in Swiss part and as well in Go. <coughs> To describe uh, the, the viral protein uh, functions, except for two ones, or n 7 b may be linked to, to interferon, but you see of eight, we have no idea what it does. So I'm really curious to, to know <laughs> what this protein is doing. The coronavirus life cycle has been drawn, uh, it's here, so uh, the, the viral particle outside will recognize the receptor that will trigger endocytosis by the cell. It's actually the cell which engulfs the virus, the virus is taking tricking the cell to be taken inside. Then the virus will provoke a fusion of membrane, release his messenger RNA. So it's a very big 30 kilobases messenger RNA that will be translated into the polyprotein first. The polyprotein will take care of the cell, will induce the vesicles, and then inside the vesicles, the replication will start. Uh, subgenomic RNA will start to be done as well. So the first genome will be recycled to make more replication, and at a certain moment, the subgenomic RNA will produce all the structural proteins, and then the, the full genome will be encapsulated and bled out, okay? Um, so we, are, we have annotated all the proteins. This is a representation of it. Um, so um, 
all the subgenomic RNA have been annotated using AMAP, which is a highly high quality automated manual annotation of proteins. It's very convenient because we can then annotate all the coronavirus day proteins or beta coronavirus with one rule. We have also created the interactome uh, because there have been a lot, some publications of large scale uh, uh, interaction which are um, of mild quality in, in my view. So here we, we have gone for all the literature since SARS 2003 and see everything that could be relevant and, and similar. So you see in light green things have been shown for SARS-CoV-2, the others have been shown for SARS-CoV-2003. And mostly except for receptor here, we, there is a new feature that the furin is able to cleave the spike. The spike needs to be activated outside of the cell to be able to provoke fusion. Uh, so usually it's TMPSS2, but also the furin in SARS-CoV-2 is able to do that. It's a new feature. It binds the CO2 just like the other one. And you will see that it could bind also uh, other receptors. This is not shown definitely. And most of the interaction we see uh, that have been shown with SARS-2003 are a modulation of host antiviral system. For example, BST2 is a tethering, which, uh, um, which tether actually the virus to the membrane when it's gone out. So the virus is not able to, 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 to move the new cells. And ROF7A just prevent that. Okay, um, on top of the antiviral uh, cycle, we could plug the, the, the antiviral drugs. And you see that I will not go too much into details because of well, no time, but there are drugs which will um, inhibit the spike maturation. So the virus will not be able to make fusion. You have fusion inhibitor that prevents the, the maturation of the endosome. You also protease inhibitor. For example, in uh, HIV, uh, you have very uh, efficient compounds for the protease of HIV. So it could be working with coronavirus as well. Uh, you have polymerase inhibitors. And you have also anti-inflammatory antibodies and neutralizing antibodies, which are many for clinical or for, of course, uh, vaccines will be neutralizing antibodies, which would be the best. Um, to be short, in all the the serious trial which have been done, but you mentioned none have done, uh, have given um, good results in clinical. Um, only remdesivir have weak effect, which means that uh, you, the virus will be deadly with like 3% less. Uh, so it's not bad, but it's not there. But I think in the future, maybe one year or two, we could have better antivirals. So the resource links also to external resources, of course, the COVID in product resource, I will talk just after. Uh, you have also a SARS-CoV-2 um, resource of the SIB, which includes a uh, Swiss model, for example, Uniprot, uh, Cellosaurus, and many other features. Next trend, which is really uh, awesome to see pretty much uh, in live the phylogeny of the virus uh, growing every day. <coughs> PDB has made also a resource for all crystallization. There have been a lot of crystallization of the new virus. NCBI made as well for publication sequences. Elixir has done as well. <coughs> I've put also some courses by Britt Kersingler of California, which explain the, the biology of coronavirus very well, and a few other um, links. <coughs> so these resources have been widely popular. You see there are about 1,000 pages in, in the R zone, and uh, these, these two 10 new pages have almost doubled the uh, visits in the past months. And usually in yellow, in uh, orange, sorry, you have uh, the 2019 visit of R zone. This is Google Analytics, by the way. And in blue, you have 2020. So you see it really rised up. And now we are looking a little bit of a Uniprot annotation. So uh, Uniprot has a release cycle, which is now about two months, because there's a lot of computation to be done on all the protein and to be updated. <coughs> so it's extremely long and it could be longer in the future, but this could not be uh, efficient in, in moment of pandemic, of course. So uh, the consortium, Swissprot and ABI and, and PIR have, think, have thought a lot um, 
they were able very quickly to mount a site which pre-release the, the, the entries. <coughs> so it's outside of the normal release of Unipod, so it's updated pretty much weekly. And uh, this gives access to up-to-date information for this important uh, proteins, which are the SARS coronavirus. It's available, it's available there, you can click. So there are not only the SARS-2, but it's also the SARS-2003, and many human proteins, which have been also uh, updated because they interact with uh, these coronaviruses. Now, um, bioinformatics is not just a tool for biologists, it's also able to make predictions. And actually by analyzing uh, in the end of January the spike protein, we find a little prosite uh, uh, <coughs> pattern that highlighted the RGD on the protein. And for, for me, RGD was talking a lot because I've been uh, annotating a database of uh, human virus interaction for entry, and many virus are binding uh, integrin, which is triggered by this RGD, okay? And you see it's not present in any other coronavirus, just SARS-CoV-2 have it. And for all the sequence we have, it's conserved. Uh, using Swiss model, because at the time there was no uh, crystallization, we were able to show that it was, the RGD was at the top, so it was possible that it was really top bound by integrin or, or play a role in receptor, because in blue, here you see the receptor binding for ACA2, so it makes sense. <coughs> so we are able to make a, an accelerated uh, publication in that, and uh, research is still ongoing. We don't know if it's uh, if integrin it has been not shown so far, if it's true or false, but the prediction uh, is, is tested, so we were waiting for the results. So we want to start all the thank all the people in the Swiss Prod group for the COVID resource, integrin publication, and the Uniprod COVID-19 site, which have been involved a lot of effort actually, also for clinical expertise, Pauline Wetter from HUG. And conclusion, I would say that if you want to see the big picture of the coronavirus, go to VAR zone. You will have a lot of information, a lot of links. Um, <coughs> the COVID gene model sequence and protein analysis have been uh, truthfully uh, performed there. And also, integrin may play a role in various attachment. That's what bioinformatics tells us. We will see. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Philip, for this amazing uh, talk on, uh, on SARS-CoV-2. Uh, for a matter of time, we will only take one question. And this is a question from Amos. Uh, about this uh, enigmatic protein of eight, uh, you say that you would be very happy to <laughs> to find clues. So Amos found uh, a paper in Bioarchive um, mentioning that this protein uh, could mediate immune evasion through potentially downregulating MHC class one. And mm -hmm. I'd like to know what you thought about this study, if you are aware of this study. <laughs> No, no, I'm not aware of this study. Okay. There's so many things in bioarchive. Uh, I really have trouble following everything, but it would make sense actually. Uh, I suspect something like this for the modulation of the immune system. But okay. we look to it. Thank you, Amos. <laughs> and you have plenty of other questions that will be addressed in the, in the session after. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Martin Reinders. Uh, uh, who is a postdoc in the group of uh, Robert Waterhouse. And uh, um, so Martin works on a, on a tool which is named CrowdGo and uh, which tries to improve the predictions uh, of protein function, which is a very difficult task. Uh, yes, thank you. It is indeed a very difficult task. So I'm trying to make it easier. Uh, so CrowdGo is a gene ontology uh, prediction tool for protein functions where gene ontology, of course, is the primary way of uh, summarizing protein functions. Uh, it uses a meta approach, meaning that it takes the predictions from existing tools, multiple existing tools, and tries to combine them to get to a better prediction. So these are the four tools that I use in this analysis for CrowdGo, and they are represented in a precision recall curve, where the precision is the relative amount of true positives that are predicted compared to false positives, and the recall is the amount of true Go terms that we are actually able to retrieve. All right, so these four tools, they all 
uh, predict reasonably well, some of them better than others, but all reasonably well. However, if we compare them, if you compare the predictions, what we see is that uh, for every Go term, it is either predicted by one tool, two tools, three tools, or four tools. However, it very rarely happens that it is predicted by three tools and almost never that it is predicted by all four of the tools. However, we can use this information of overlap and non-overlap to get a consensus prediction, to get to a better prediction. And this is what CrowdGo aims to do. So very briefly on how it works. Okay, so can we increase precision and recall by combining existing predictions? And very briefly on how it works, let's say that we have three methods that we are trying to compare. And they all predict uh, gene ontology terms, where of course the gene ontology is represented in a hierarchical way, where the term on the bottom includes the function of all the ones that are parent terms on top. So what we can then do is if the first method predicts this go term, the second method predicts this go term, and the third method predicts this go term, so we can say, okay, the bottom two go terms that are being predicted are much more similar to each other than they are to the one that's predicted on top. And also the one that's predicted on top is much more of a general go term with much less information than the ones on the bottom. So using this information, we can create similarity scores. Um, we can group the predictions together from multiple different tools. And using that, we can apply supervised learning where we can train an algorithm to uh, uh, try to recognize the probability of a prediction being a true positive or the prediction being a false positive. So that's the essence of CrowdGo. And if we then apply CrowdGo on our benchmarking data set, remember that the other four tools are used as an input to CrowdGo in this case. And we see that if we combine these tools in CrowdGo, which is the blue line, we get a much higher precision. So this is the kind of result that we are looking for. Um, however, this is a very abstract result. We also try to analyze CrowdGo on a more uh, real case scenario. So what we did is we um, uh, re-annotated the proteome of Arabidopsis and we re-annotated the proteome of uh, the tomato, both available on Uniprot. Uh, so the first ones you see here uh, is a violent plot uh, of uh, go terms per protein. Um, and the first one you see is the Arabidopsis proteome as represented by Uniprot currently. And the second one is by Swissprot only. So remember that the Swissprot is a curated database. So those Go terms attached to a protein are much more reliable than the Go terms attached to the other Uniprot proteins. And what we see is that we only look at the Swissprot proteins for Arabidopsis. We get a much better distribution of Go terms per protein than we do for the one for the entire Uniprot. For the entire Uniprot, we get a lot of proteins with very few Go terms attached to it. And then if we re annotate Arabidopsis using CrowdGo, we get a distribution that's very similar to the Swissprot protein. So in that way, we can say, okay, the distribution is at least what we expect to see if we have reliable annotations. Now, if we do the same thing for the tomato protein, which is a non-model species, and hardly, if any, has proteins available in Swissprot, so only in Uniprot, we get more of a Christmas tree instead of a proper violin structure. This means that uh, most proteins have one or two go terms attached to it, which is not at all what we want. If we re-annotate tomato with CrowdGo, we still have a bunch of proteins that hardly have any Go terms, but we get a much better distribution that's more similar to the one in Arabidopsis. So this result of the uh, Go term annotations distributions compared to, to the recall that a uh, precision and recall that I just showed makes us believe at least that CrowdGo is definitely an improvement in uh, protein function annotation. So finally, I just want to uh, emphasize here that CrowdGo comes with pre-trained models. Uh, using the tools that we uh, just showed, but you can also make your own models using different tools. In theory, CrowdGo can use any tool that is out there for go term prediction. And you can do both of this using SnakeMate pipelines that we provided. Uh, it can be found on my GitLab. And uh, finally, I want to thank the Waterhouse Group where I do my postdoc. And please come talk to my poster after this session where we can talk more about methods or if you actually want to use CrowdGo, we can talk about that. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. So now we'll have David Lyon from the group of Christian von Mering at the University of Zurich. And he will present another analysis about uh, gene ontology. So his tool is a go tool, which is for the en enrichment analysis specifically tailored for proteomics applications. So we will listen to you, David. Thank you. Hello and uh, welcome to my talk about uh, a Go tool. So there's uh, quite a few enrichment tools out there, 
but I'd like to use the next moments to tell you how and why a Go tool stands out. Classic enrichment analysis was tailored towards genomics data. And then proteomics people simply applied it to proteomics data. But there's a problem with this because proteins cannot be amplified like DNA. So this means that there's an abundance bias in proteomics data. The more abundant a protein is, the more likely it is to be detected by, for example, mass spectrometry. When studying post-translationally modified proteins, so PTM proteins, this effect can be even more pronounced since not every single copy of a protein will be modified in the same way. And the stoichiometry is often not 100%. When you compare modified proteins to the genome, you often find enrichment for abundant proteins rather than modified proteins. For example, you'll get a lot of enrichment for the ribosomal proteins, which is not what you want since you're not getting relevant and biologically meaningful terms. So what you should do is have an appropriate control group to compare to. We've created a simple method to control for this bias by scaling the background, so the things you're comparing to, the background distribution to mimic the foreground. So this method is specifically tailored towards PTM data. It makes the two groups you're comparing more equal in size and enables a more suitable comparison. So just as a side note, we also provide other methods besides this abundance correction. So let's now look at a specific example. We've taken yeast proteins, um, post-translationally modified by succinylation, and are comparing these to three different groups. The largest amount of um, enriched terms result when comparing to the genome. The second largest when comparing to the observed proteome, which are simply those proteins we can observe in a mass spectrometer. And when using our abundance correction method, we actually find no significant terms whatsoever. So why is this a good thing that we don't find any rich terms? In yeast, succinylation is an untargeted and non-enzymatic process, which means you would not expect to find any particular, you would not expect any particular compartment or biological process to be involved. So there should actually not be any rich terms for this data. This is a extreme example to showcase the method. In general, when using abundance correction, um, you can expect to find more biologically meaningful terms and less clutter. We don't only offer classic gene ontology terms, but also other functional categories. Some of them come from text mining data, such as diseases, tissues, and PubMed publications. Part of these protein to function associations are not binary, but they come with a continuous score. This means that for part of the data, we use a Kamalgarov-Smirnov test instead of a classic Fisher's exact test. A distinguishing feature of this web tool is that we provide monthly updates of the resources, which is particularly interesting for the text mining data, but also for the other resources, just thinking about all the bio curators putting work and effort into their tools. So other enrichment tools, such as David, which was referenced before in a talk, are typically not updated after their initial publication. And this is what the web interface looks like, um, but there's also a REST API for programmatic access. The results are grouped by category, and there's a compact as well as a wide formatted comprehensive view. The screenshot actually shows the results of a characterized foreground method um, using uniprot selection of COVID-19 related proteins. We use different tools and technologies to um, realize this project. Um, and are actually currently working on an uh, interactive visualization of the results. And I'd be happy to take any questions later on in the session. I hope I piqued your interest in uh, this tool and uh, wanna thank you for your attention and also my group for their support and of course my collaborators. Thank you very much, David. Uh, the, so we will answer, uh, you. We will ask our questions in the in the next uh, session. Uh, so the last, the very last talk of uh, of this session is uh, by Roman Milonos, uh, who works in the group of Manfredo Quadroni at University of Lausanne, and uh, he will present us a new tool which is called Pumba, and uh, and which is uh, which aims to help people to validate Western blot results using mass spec data. So Roman. It's yours. Yes, hello. I just had a problem. 
coding on my screen. So let's start now. I still cannot access. Okay, it's good. Okay, I would like to present you Pumba, which is a web resource to verify antibody-based results. And more precisely, it's uh, to, to verify results you produce by doing uh, Western blocks. I just have again a problem. Like I cannot change the slides. Do you still hear me? Yes. We because well. I cannot see my mouse and I cannot share the slide. Uh, yeah, yeah, it and works. Now, now it's working. Okay, yeah. let's go like that. Okay, so Western blots, they are very widely used. It's one of the most commonly used techniques in, in web labs, actually. And unfortunately, they're also poorly reproducible. And they're also prone to artifacts. So that's why we decided uh, to build up a database where you use mass spectrometry data to verify antibody-based results. So to use an orthogonal technique to those antibody-based results. So we built up Pumba, a database where, which you can access by the link you see above. And uh, actually what we have there is gel migration patterns, which then were analyzed by mass spectrometry. So those are the same gels that are used for Western bots, and we analyze them afterwards with mass spectrometry. We currently have nearly 7,000 proteins and four different human cell lines, and we're on the way of adding more human cell lines, and we would also like to add mouse cell lines. So let's look at the example. So what you can see here, that's a Western blot where we tried to identify fast KD2, so this protein fast KD2. And what you already can see, it's not very pretty. So that's normal for Western bots. They're mostly not very pretty. You can see on the y-axis, uh, it's a separation of the, the proteins by their molecular weight. And there are, in this case, three replicates. So you can see three bands, and they're all at the same position. And that should be actually FASCAD2. But in this case, it says 55 kilodalton. We know that because the internal standard is added to the Western block. But the theoretical weight of this FASCAD2, it's actually at 81 kilodalton. So there's a gap. So the question is, are those bands that we see really FASCAD2? To answer that, we can look at Pumba. We load the protein from Pumba, and we can see that for all the four cell lines, we have the same pattern as we have in the Western block. So we have the main identification below at a lighter weight than expected. So we can answer the question with, yes, this is FASCAD2. But now the question is, but why do we have it with this unexpected weight? So again, we can look in Pumba at a, another graph that we're seeing. In this case, on the y-axis, again, we have the separation by molecular weight, but this time on the x-axis, we have the whole protein sequence. So this is the protein sequence of this fast KD2. And the, the little lines you can see in the graph, those are the peptides that were identified using mass spectrometry. And what we can see here is that the, the peptides start to be identified at 118, and they are uh, identified before the end, actually. So there's a, a part of the protein that is not visible here. So from this, we can deduce that what we're looking at, it's actually a major proteoform. So this was just a small example of how Pumba can be used to verify your Western dots. There are more visualizations there, and it's all interactive. So I would like to thank all the people who worked on this project and you for the attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Roman. And thank you everyone for the very nice presentation and for keeping on time. It was really great talks. And also thank you for the attendees for your presence and for participating in multiple questions. And now we can switch to the meet the speaker room where we will continue the discussion and you can ask further questions to the presenter. So 
you should now disconnect from this Zoom and go to the meeting, uh, meet the speaker room to, to further discuss. Uh, see you there.